Is this better? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let me start over again. Um, my name is Anne Marie Murphy. I am a uh, adjunct senior research fellow here at uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and a professor at Seton Hall School of Diplomacy. And it's my pleasure uh, on behalf of the Weatherhead Institute to invite you to today's talk to discuss Thailand and the new monarchy under King Basila Lankorn. I, I know I mispronounced that. Um, as I'm sure you all know, after 70 years uh, on the throne, uh, the former Thai king Bumipon passed away in 2016 and his son ascended to the throne. During his long reign, King Bumipon ruled as a constitutional monarch. He cultivated an image of the father of the Thai nation who was apolitical and above politics. He accumulated a moral authority through the reinvention Configuration of a royalist ideology that enabled him to step in at pivotal times to diffuse crisis. Um, since ascending to the throne, his son has adopted a very different management style, becoming a pivotal political actor, centralizing authority under the monarchy, transferring assets formerly held by the state to himself, so that today the king holds more power than at any time since the absolute monarchy in Thailand was overthrown in 1932. These moves, as many of you know, uh, have triggered strong opposition from many in Thailand, including students and the youths, who have issued a series of demands, including the reform of the monarchy. So to discuss these changes and the implications for Thai politics, we are extremely lucky to have with us today, uh, Professor Pawin Chachabong Pongpan, um, <laughs> who, who is an associate professor at the University of Kyoto in Japan uh, at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. He teaches classes on Southeast Asia. He edits the Kyoto Review. He is a prolific author um, of numerous books. He edited the fantastic uh, Rutledge Handbook on Thai politics, and he is the forthcoming editor of a new book Rama X, The New Time Monarchy, that'll be uh, out with Yale University Press later this year, later this year. So there is nobody better poised to speak on this topic. As you know, given Thai's Leje Majesté laws, speaking out on the monarchy uh, can have critical um, penalties. And uh, Powen will discuss some of those uh, that have been um, issued against him uh, in his talk. So for those of you uh, at home, uh, we will have a 30 to 40 minute presentation by Pa Win, and we will then open it up to Q&A. So anybody who wants to pose some questions, the Q&A box is open. Over to you. So much, uh, Anne-Marie. <laughs> Uh, I'm delighted to be back to Colombia. Uh, the focus of this talk will be on King Vashonongon and the new monarchy. And uh, I'll be, as Amory said, I'll be speaking maybe 30 to 40 minutes and I'll be happy to, to get feedbacks and, and questions from you. Uh, it's all begin in October, 2016, when uh, King Puyipon passed away. I remember that I was uh, with Berkeley at, at, at the time then. Berkeley thought that, oh my God, it was so fantastic to have Pawin with us. So why don't we have a, a round table on the passing of King Pumipon? It turned out to be a disaster because they just want to balance you know, the, the pan panelists. So by having me there and bringing in sort of hyper-royalists you know, in California. And as I said, as you, as you would know, I don't have to explain anything. So it turned out to be a disaster. Uh, I mean, time have fly. So yeah, I think, I think that, that, that was a turning point in Thai politics uh, from 2016 onward. And it's all uh, began in the 1st of December, 2016, when Washington Kong was officially crowned, right? It took him a few months uh, before uh, the, the, the succession process uh, started. From that moment on, you started to see the, the transition uh, from Pumipon to Washelongkorn. And this trans transition has been uh, 
very stark uh, simply because of the, the the differences in in many many areas between the two reigns. And one of the thing, one of the things that has been most outstanding has been uh, the different in personalities of the two kings and personalities and image has been very important you know, for Thai politics and, and in, in particular in the context of, of Thai monarchy and its involvement in politics, in, in the political life of Thailand. So from 2016, then came 2020 with the protests uh, on the street of Bangkok, lasted until 2000, uh, 2021. Uh, and I was so excited to see that protest because it was the first time that uh, the issue of the monarchy had been made public. So anyone who has followed me for, for so long. So I have done this, you know, on my own, almost 10 years now. Uh, and all those time, I would not believe that one day the monarchy would become a public issue. Even though I have come out and talk about this so openly, you know, talking you know, to various universities in the United States, including launching my own project about the monarchy. So until 2020, that when uh, the kids in Bangkok started to give me hope that eventually Thailand might be able to move forward from this point. So uh, this is a brief introduction of what I would, I hope to, to, to discuss uh, for this talk. But before moving on to talk about the new king, Washington, I think it is useful to look back a little bit in order to find such connection, whether there would be uh, such disconnection rather than connection. Uh, over a year ago, I launched a book, Cool King Crisis, so that book basically looked at the transition from Pumipon to Washington. And in that book, I argue that uh, it would be useful to look back at uh, what Kam Kam Shi has said about uh, political transition. And there is one in, one, one in particular that is very interesting about the interregnum that, you know, in, in some circumstances, especially in, in, uh, in the Middle Age in Europe, uh, when the old system has died, but yet the, the new system has not arrived. So it caused such a critical interregnum that thing could go wrong. So I would like to think that Thailand, you know, from uh, I think the last decade, you know, uh, and I started with uh, Pui Pon being hospitalized from 2009, that when I think the, 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 the royal propaganda started to decline from 2009 onward, including the decline of the royal, royal hegemony under King Pumipon. Uh, that to me, I think that was the beginning of the critical interregnum in Thailand until at least, you know, 2006. Uh, that when things started to happen in Thailand, uh, weird things starting to happen in Thailand. So uh, during this period as well, there's a number of scholars try to explain this situation. The situation of uh, the old system has died, but we, but we cannot find what would be the right thing or the right system for Thailand. For example, Mekako, who was with Colombia, you know, as you know, uh, with his uh, now become so useful uh, discussion instrument on network monarchy. So, so uh, Mekako sort of looking at the whole thing as a kind of network, and he explained that the best uh, the best way to look at Thai politics is to look at, at it as a kind of political network. And the most powerful political network in Thailand from 1960s, 1970s, or at the height of the Cold War has been network monarchy that has been controlling Thai politics. I think that's quite useful to look at it, right? Uh, but might not be useful now uh, when you look at Washington gone. I will, I'll, I'll explain why that uh, network monarchy might not be useful at this point in time. Tong Chai also explained an, uh, from Another perspective, he look at he look at the whole thing as a kind of uh, royal nationalist ideology, right? For the king, for the monarchy to become prominent, so it has to come with na royal nationalist ideology. Uh, and I, I I took this and work on top of it uh, by proposing that the success of Pumipon is based on uh, what it call neo royalism. So there's so many new things. We talk about Pumipon and neo royalism, and we talk about new monarchy under Washington now. Now, putting Washington aside first, looking back at Pumipon and neo royalism, uh, I think it, it had become a formula of the success of Pumipon based on three things under this royal nationalist ideology. 
the first thing is to make Pumipon sacred, right? And that's why the king had to go go through, you know, uh, presenting himself as a good Buddhist, you know, being ha- having a lovely family, being a family man, you know, uh, uh, adhere to Buddhism, something like that. Second one is to make him popular. So this, you know, came with the uh, famous Royal Developmental Project. So it, it linked up with the way in which the king used this to increase his own popularity. So this allowed him to this allowed him to travel in even the most remote areas, uh, starting with 19, late 1950. In fact, with the uh, recommendation of the Americans that you need to go out and see people, especially in the, in the area uh, supposedly dominated by the communists. That's why the king started this project and then uh, going into the north and north, northeast of Thailand. And then came also an international tour of Pumipon during 1960, right? So, for example, the highlight of the international tour of Pumipon in order to, uh, to increase his popularity, popularity, not just at home, but also on the international stage, basically when he came to the United States in 1960. And that is very important. Again, we will talk about Washington, whether he would have the international tour, like his father or not. Uh, the last one is to make him democratic. This one is very tricky, you know, because I, I have to use the term uh, by Tong Chai, uh, royalism and democracy, two things that has become oxymoron, but Pui Pon make it work. So he termed, he termed this, this thing called royal, royal democracy. Basically, uh, he would like to present monarchy as an alternative uh, to democracy. So when you have no hope, on politician, then you can have your trust in the monarchy. And, you know, we just work, that's fine. We just, you know, can become compatible between the two. Of course it's not, because you're talking about royal, royal institution, which is not accountable, which is not transparency. So that is nothing really democratic about it. But again, we won't make it work. How he make it work? Because of his occasional interference in politics, especially in time of crisis. He was really good at finding the right moment to intervene. And I would give you this uh, uh, prime example of 1992 uh, for in the uh, Black May in, in Thailand. So also have to wait for the bloodshed to, to, to take place and then to intervene in order to stop the bloodshed. And I think that that was the, uh, the pinnacle of Roy, he- Roy Hegemony under King Washington, in, sorry, under King Pui Pon uh, in 1992, when he called upon the two opposing sides, right? One uh, Tom Long and one Sujinda on their knee, you know, and this was televised on TV, carefully choreographed, you know, so that was very powerful. To the point that, you know, Thai people, including my generation, I wouldn't say that I'm that, that old, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely not old, but, 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 but my generation and even younger generation have this perception of the king being the uh, the stab- stabilizing force in Thailand. So whenever we 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 hit the deadlock, you know, oh yeah, we we're gonna be fine because the king gonna intervene and the, the king gonna find a way out uh, for us. So that has become uh, the third uh, pillar of the neo royalist royalism, uh, being democratic, right? So uh, I think that's again very useful if you want to use uh, these three elements in order to to explain or to try to understand Washington Gone Rain. That could be done. So, in fact, I did. Uh, I did many years ago. I did write uh, this piece or for uh, in in Asian survey, trying to use this uh, framework to 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 anticipate what would happen with uh, Washington. <laughs> and when I look back, you know, I was wrong quite a lot. So that's why you know, being an academic, you should not write anything in the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> the third one, which I think very interesting, is uh, Ajahn Kassian talking about weapon consensus. Right, uh, and 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 I I think I should read it out. Uh, according to Gassian, uh, Pui Pon consensus was perceived to be a kind of social contract, uh, which arguably uh, fostered the stability required Thailand to develop as a modern nation. Under this contract, different political classes negotiated their political interests uh, to a degree commensurate with their pos- position of power. They were informal yet. Real, uh, yet real sphere 
and jurisdiction of power allocated to respective political classes. This sphere and jurisdiction of power were not officially recognized by laws and the constitution, yet each political class accepted its own boundary and jurisdiction of power while acknowledging that of other classes. Uh, with King Puyipon performing as uh, the final arbiter when conflict among them uh, erupted. So the, the Puyipon consensus functioned effectively at least until the arrival of Taksin in 2001. So Taksin is another player which uh, we will be discuss, uh, discussing a bit later. So I just want, just want to bring in a kind of, you know, frameworks available in order to understand Puyipon and 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 uh, Washington Ren. I think to a to a certain extent, uh, Gaussian's uh, framework could also be useful. Uh, in a sense that then what would be the net consensus? If Puyipon consensus had ended, uh, I don't know. I I don't have an answer for this. But hopefully, you know, without this discussion, there could be some new thought. Uh, that could allow us to to predict what will happen. Now, uh, going into Washington Ren. Okay. Uh, prior to prior to he coming uh, on the throne, there's a lot of rumors about whether it would be Washington gone, whether it would be his sister. Uh, there's a lot of rumors as well about the conflict between uh, the famous sister and also himself. In fact, you know, of course, the rumors uh, was were groundless. Uh, this is because even prior to the 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 succession in 2016, we started to see. Uh, Washington exerting his power in the palace, right? While his father was uh, on on basic. So, for example, you know, prior to the the departure of Puyipon, uh, Washington already started to reorganize the Privy Council. The Privy Council was very important. Started in Rama the fifth, Rama the fifth, as sort of advisory board for the king, and uh, it, it was very powerful during Puyipon. Uh, in fact, that what Macaco said that you know it it became an engine that uh, drove uh, network monarchy. You know it was the Privy Council, in particular, Prem Tinsulanon with the preview, uh, the president of the Privy Council. So, but then that all gone. Uh, in I, I'm talking about in terms of the powerful, the the power, powerful position and structure of the Privy Council, because it was it has been reorganized by the king. Uh, for example. Uh, just two things. For example, the king had the, the constitution amended uh, so that when he travels overseas, he doesn't have to nominate the region. Normally, the region would be the president of the pre Privy Council that would, you know, decide on behalf of the king when the king is not at home. And you know that Russian Russian gone at the beginning of his reign, he had gone away for so long, sometimes years. So the 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 question of regency that's why it became so important. So the king did not want anyone to work on his behalf. So that's why uh, he had he has requested the, the consent to be amended that he did not need to appoint any region while he resides overseas. I think this, this, there's a lot of uh, interpretation for this amendment. For one thing, it's basically the king tried to reduce the role and the power of, of the, of the pre Privy Council. Instinct, instead of using the Privy Council as a kind of proxy uh, during Pumipon reign, the king would want to, to have a kind of direct interference into politics. I'm not saying that Puyipon did not do direct interference. The example of 1992, that was a kind of direct interference. But Puyipon had done a lot more that you would never see from behind the scene. But I think this is started to change. Uh, and uh, then, then we people can talk about the conflict between Brem and, and also uh, uh, Washington Kong as well. You know, and what was caught talking to American ambassadors years before about not happy being uh, seeing Washington gone being on the throne. He would rather see you know someone else. So that's why you could start. You started to see a kind of you know per personality personality crash. You maybe you could uh, try to explain that this is also a way to uh, uh, to try to diminish uh, the 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 power of of Bram as well. And uh, another thing also about the uh, the the crowd property bureau as well, which I will go into into that next, uh, because a lot of uh, a lot of 
privy councilor also sit in the board of the of the car property bureau now from 2000 the transition 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 started from 2017 to 2018 when uh, the the king transferred all uh, the the chairs from the car property bureau as a state institution into his own possession so this is kind of big thing the two thing the, the the amendment of the constitution and the transfer of of the uh, the the, the the ownership of the car property bureau into Washington. This rests an issue of the cons constitutional right or the legal right of the king. The plain question is that on what on what legal uh, how how could I say uh, on what legal basis that the king was allowed to exercise his right? That will come in the next book. Let me add my advertise again. <laughs> Written by David Stratford, talking about the source of legitimacy and legality of King Washington. I don't have an answer for you today. I would rather you read that book. But 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 that's good enough to raise an issue where the source of legal power of Washington, when the king is supposed to be under the the constitu constitution. And I mean, we can go on and on and on. And I'll, I'll show you uh, another kind of evidence about him going out and about to dismiss people, to demote people. And we have seen almost on a daily basis uh, in, uh, in the Royal Gazette, right? And, and it has become a kind of such an embarrassment, you know, for those who has been punished, you know, by the king. But anyway, uh, so, uh, so I'm going back to the point that, you know, it's all started even before, even before Pui Pon, uh, Pui Pon passing. Uh, the change has come in two ways. And in my own interpretation, micro and macro, right? So talking about the, the, the privy council and the chain of the car property bureau, maybe we're looking at the micro level, level but we also have to look at, uh, at micro as well. Uh, now talking about micro first, amending the constitution, right? Uh, bring, bringing some offices under his direct supervision, especially uh, uh, the office of His Majesty, uh, Principal Private Secretary. Don't forget that this this used to be sort of under you know uh, uh, being a state institution, if not under the government, right? And also the Bureau of Royal Household. From now on, it means the king could decide and do things by himself on his own without any consultation with the government. Uh, also, the uh, the transfer would exempt uh, these offices from scrutiny by independent organization as long as since it has become under the supervision direct supervision of the king that's it right we cannot inspect you know and then there's a, an, an, another issue of tax as well <laughs> this is a big issue but yet no one in thailand talk about it uh going back to car property, car property, car property bureau that had no been that had no paid tax right and including issue of sort of joy uh investment between property bureau and private sector like Siam Simen also go without paying tax. You know, no one would be able to talk about this in public. Uh, then he also ordered uh, the transfer of two military units, Rashwalop and the 11 Infantry Regiment under his own. So, and also from the military chain of command to the Royal Security Command under direct control of the palace in order to consolidate, you know, his personal authority. We also have to talk about uh, Lashua Lop as well, but maybe during the Q&A, this is his personal uh, army, started like in 1970s. But because throughout uh, the, the Pumipon period, Washington was almost left out from this uh, dynamic relationship between the military and the monarchy. We know that uh, Pumipon uh, had this firm working relationship with the military, but not so with Washington. So that's why, you know, he, he set up his own uh, personal army. Right now it's about six, six, five, sorry, five to 6,000 personnel. Not very popular. Not very popular because no, one, no other country would want to see fragmentation of the army, right? And this is basically the demonstration of the fragmentation of the, of the army. No, it's, it's, it's not popular also because if you join the army, you know, People would like to see their future ahead, you know. According to the tradition in the army, if you want to become an army chief, of course you have to go down this route of, you know, joining national army, not Washington, you know, this little upscale army. That's why it's not popular. And 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 also the discipline and you know, the, the short haircut, you know, the the need, you know, uniform, the over the top, 
uh, you know, posted of yok ok, up, something like that, which is so funny. You know, it's just it's just so absurd. So, but anyway, uh, and handpick the army chief. You know, the 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 the, the, the consecutive two army chief, they were handpicked by the palace. So again, there's nothing in 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 the world, you know, especially in democratic country or even in constitutional monarchy, that the king or the monarch could pick, you know, his or her own, uh, army chief. And the worst part of it is that the government uh, has been willing to uh, set this new protocol in order to legitimize his violation of the constitution. So the government has been okay with what, whatever the king has been doing so far. Uh, so that has been the, the, the macro, how to say, reorganization of the, of the royal power. Now going into micro, and I'll go, I'll go very quickly. Uh, I guess I have another 10 minutes. Sure. Okay. Fear. Fear is the instrument. Again, and this, this come of my, my recent research on the new royal government. Gov sorry, the new royal governance. Okay. And, and it's very interesting as well. If you look at uh Pumipon, and it has become a kind of dichotomy of love and fear. Now, I'm sure that I'm sure that you have heard this sort of slogan, especially the final years of Pumipon. And it has become even a sticker. A lot of people mean we love the king. Everywhere you go, you have to see the sticker. We love the king. And it, it, it also it's very interesting is that this, this particular context is only applied to the, the previous king, not the current one. So no one would say we love the king right now, right? We would have said the opposite, but no one would dare to do a sticker on it. So we love the king, but then it changed so swiftly. Then love seemed to disappear. Then what would replace love? I say fear. Fear has become a new royal governance that the king used to control, used it to control different group of different people. So uh, the first one is basically to control people surrounding him, people who work for him using fear as a kind of instrument. No, don't forget that fear can become an effective instrument of governance. It has been, it, it was so effective during again, middle age of Europe, right? Fear could last it for, for some time, you know, before it start, start to evaporate. Uh, in my own research, uh, I managed to record uh, from August 2016 to August 2020 during the period of three years uh, uh, after Washington has become king. Uh, there's a pattern of fear, right? He would punish people who work for him. You know, through different means and methods. For example, dismissing them, demoting them, right? This also applicable to monk, deroping them. But it, it doesn't come with just this dismissal, dismissal or a demotion. It comes with uh, public humiliation and also cursing, right? I'll show you the, uh, this one, this website. So uh, this is this is my own uh, compilation uh, because I, I did this for for a uh, journal of uh, current self station fair and they don't they just don't have enough room for me in the in the journal to publish the entire table. So instead, I put here and refer in my in, in my article to come to come to this website. I will I just go quickly with you know number one, number two, number three, and and you see the uh the uh, causes of uh dismissal and demotion misbehaving distrusted disloyal and then this would be the consequences this means uh the last vote basically looking colon colonel something like that and basically they, they were just dismissed from their from their position i just want to highlight only one particular entry which is uh look at the number right all this and then everything has been published in royal cassette right uh Number 65, you know, you would be family with her. Sidina Wong Wachila Papi, who is the, 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 the second wife of the king. Again, she has disappeared from the public huh. now. Uh, after, after elevating her to become a Dalkun Pra, you know, just a few months after he married his first wife, he would, she was sent to jail. And the reason for being sent to jail is because of these causes, extremely evil behavior, disloyal, jealous, ambitious, Elevate herself to the same status as a queen, disrespectful, 
disobedient, abusing power, exploiting the name of the king, ungrateful. So the consequence has been uh, being dismissed, disowned, imprisoned, de 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 decorated, right? The last question basically, uh, but then again, uh, with miracles, she come back. So I <laughs> uh, have to go back to it. Uh, right. Now, uh, if you if you read it in English, it might not be that bad. <laughs> but why don't we do in Thai? Uh, now, you must know if you Thai that these are really bad, bad, bad language. Yeah. <laughs> ไว้สำนึกในพระมหากรุณาธิคุณโอเคกระด้างกระเดื่อง okay. Oh my god I just forgot this word I mean it has been used like for a long long time I had never heard it for 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 quite some time อ่าขาดความกตัญญู uh, uh, and also ขาดความทุ่มเท something like that I mean the, the 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 term in Thai has been has been quite bad so in order to basically uh to to humiliate them and to keep them in control uh then then we we heard about uh Tuivatana Palace we heard about Tuivatana prison that the the king has built his own prison in his own palace and there's a there's a number of story that has has been ongoing inside there's an issue of uh you know not not just about you know threatening them with fear. But now I started to to move forward to to just people who uh, has become enemy of the palace as well. We have cases of dissidents, you know, uh, uh, refugees who uh, had been uh, abducted and killed, you know, uh, across the border in Laos and in Cambodia. In my case, in my own case, I was attacked in my own home, home in Kyoto. Luckily, that the Japanese police managed to arrest uh, arrest the man uh, later this year. Uh, then other things uh, which come with fear, even in terms of, you know, uh, with physical establishment, for things start to disappear from the public. So we talk about the, 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 the plot of uh, Kanara, the disappearance of certain buildings and, and monuments, uh, especially uh, those celebrate, uh, celebrating uh, the, the, the Kanara, of 1932, something like that. This is literally go to show uh, the king's sort of intention. Uh, you you can't explain it other way apart from apart from trying to understand that whether the king the king tried to bring back absolute monarchy by uh, discrediting you know the work uh, of the Kanara. Okay, last part, uh, and I'll be like very very quick. So that that go to point whether whether uh, absolute monarchy is on the horizon. I would not go as far to, to talk about the return of absolute monarchy, even though maybe in practice we are heading toward, we, we are heading back toward the, that direction. But I could not imagine that, you know, Thailand would really actually move back to become like Thailand pre-1932. But what I think that it might be possible from this point is basically the increase of royal absolutism. That would be my preferred term. Right by uh, the king changing certain uh, structure and 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 uh, and infrastructure in order to increase his own power. Uh, that's a sign of of we are heading toward royal absolutism. So first thing is uh, apart from what what I discussed earlier about macro and micro changes within the royal palace. So one thing is that the king and direct involvement in politics. Uh, we started to hear to see more about uh, that trend. So he started to operate without using proxy. It would be difficult to, to try to understand whether he whether he, he had any proxy, who are his proxy, you know, what this what this proxy work and 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 I guess I can't imagine, you know, I gave this I mean similar talk at ANU last, I mean two years ago. People asked me, do, do you know who's who is the king's advisor? In the previous land you would know it. And the king, the, the Puyipkon did not just have one advisor. He has so many different advisors for different projects. Now, I can't even say who's his advisor. So it seemed like, you know, he made his own decision. Kevin Harrison even said that, you know, this, this period, you know, you started to see more formal royal power than any other time since 1932. Even since, uh, during Kovenkampai with Pumipon, 
knowing that Quy Pon has become so immensely powerful, but yet, you know, right now, Wai Chong Wan has even more formal powers. Uh, second one is uh, you started to see ideological conflict as well. There has been undercurrent uh, between virtual absolutism and disguised republic. Okay, and and this has been portrayed through uh, the, the the protests in twenty twenty uh, onward, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, as as I said for the first time that, that the issue of the monarchy has been, had had been made public, and then to the point that uh, uh, the, the the youth on the street, you know, demanding uh, ten uh, ten points of reform of the monarchy, the first time ever. So you can't you can't think that. Whether, whether, whether the kid just want to stop at royal reform or the kid want to go a little bit further, right? I think, I mean, I know every one of them, you know, to say that, you know, they want a little bit further, then I would put them in trouble, right? Even in reality, you know that it would, it would never stop at royal reform because if the monarchy is interested in reform, it would, have, it would have shown some signs. But even at this point, you know, there is no sign. There has been no sign whatsoever. Right, so maybe republicanism might be something that we need to discuss seriously. But yet again, even under the current context, these are uh, republicanism, especially capital R, has been a taboo in Thailand. Talking about republicanism in Thailand today is less majestic. So, but I think it's undercurrent. And then we when people talk about the division between red and yellow. Oh my God, it has become so obsolete. No one talk about red and yellow anymore. So now we're talking about whether you're with the king or you were not with the king. And you can't be even in the middle, right? The third one, uh, uh, this is about the return of, uh, whether it's, it would be the return of absolutism. And I use the term of a Tong Chai. He used the term of the mafia system. Uh, basically, the mafia system has become associated with, uh, with the monarchy, using the law, both law and illegal means in, in order to rule. I already mentioned about fear, right? Uh, law and, you know, illegal method. Basic law, we use, they use less majesty and they use it more and more and more, right? You know, Sulak, Sulak Sivalak, you know, kept unhappy for a little while when he came out in 2017 to say that, oh, the king did not want to use less majesty because the king is fond of democracy. I have to laugh, you know, and uh, for a while. And in fact, you know, it, 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 it had shown that when the, the protests went out of control in late 2021, that when they reintroduced the less majestic law. And, and since that point onward, the reintroduction of uh, less, majest less majestic law, you, you start to see uh, the, 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 the skyrocketing cases of less majestic. You know, it's just so bad. And using illegal method, as I, as I talk about the abduction and killing uh, of, of those people. Last, last one, and I'll end here about the, the protest in 2020 and the youngs. Why are the youngs uh, are more brave than us, especially uh, than people in my generation? I believe it or not. Talking about this, this issue about the young and then the fight for democracy, sometimes, sometimes it's maybe very emotional. Uh, exactly because I have done it more than long before anyone else. But I would never consider that I'm, I'm representation of the young because even when I started, I was no longer young, right? Uh, even though, <laughs> but I never consider myself old. <laughs> yeah, it just has become so emotional that uh, we have to wait for the next generation to come out. And I try to find a reason why, why it, it it actually happened in 2020. Why it never happened before? Maybe I started to, 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 to come out with, with, with a kind of answer. Or maybe luckily, you know, a lot of them, you know, I would consider some of you young generation in this room as well. Uh, luckily that maybe, maybe you, you were young enough. I mean, you, right now you are young enough to not being dragged into a kind of propaganda, you know, especially royal propaganda under the previous reign. So imagine that uh, when, I, when I talk about the king was hosp hospitalized since 2019. No, let's say, let's say that if the kid today, 20, by then they were only 11. So, right, I think, I think they narrowly escaped being brainwashed. Whereas, you know, I was brainwashed, right? I would become you know, awakening. That was, that was the Tata Swang, you know, when, when I left Thailand, you know, in my late 20s. So, uh, 
Yeah, I think I think I think that is one one of the one of the thing that maybe we can explain that that because because they have no they have no political baggage and they have no recollection of what Pumi Pon did or manipulated during those years. So that's why basically they 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 grew up during which time that the concept of legitimacy, transparency, and the power of monarchy can be can be so different from in the past. Right. So the, I mean the current generation have that definitely different idea of what political legitimacy is comparing with my with my generation. So for me, legitimacy has to come with monarchy. Oh, no, but not this time now, you know. Second one is uh the rise of social media. So rise of rise of social media is just basic, open up everything. That again, in my in my age, you know, uh typing, you know, PhD thesis, oh my God, you know. <laughs> It's just so painful. Uh, but now, not just only that, but but it's just basic. Open up all the possibility of the the young generation to to start to compare Thailand with others, whereas in the past it would not would would not have been possible. And then uh, I like to leave by saying that you know, even though I'm a little bit older, but I like to stay on top of social media as well. Uh, and, <laughs> and 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 I know the power of social media. So and I I keep telling myself that. Uh, for me, in in order to catch up with the younger generation, I have to be on top of social media. I hope, I hope, I have been, I have been doing uh, able to to, uh, to do so. And luckily, you know, with with a uh, with an experiment like Royalist Marketplace, allow me to understand that. Oh my God! Seriously, in Thailand, people so desperate to talk about the monarchy so openly, and then and, and I just make it happen, even for the for the brief period of time. So, with that. I'd like to end it here. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Pawan's certainly given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm going to use my prerogative as chair to kind of kick off the question, which is, as you've so rightly illustrated, under King Bumipon, right, you had this network monarchy in which the king balanced interests and made sure that the spoils of power and wealth were distributed to different groups among the Bangkok business elite, the Privy Council, the military, etc. Um, and now, and they of course used the king's name to advance their own interests, but now you have the king concentrating power, which means that he's taking it away from the military, the Bangkok business elites, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So you've talked about the protests in the street, and I certainly understand that having built up this culture, you know, neo-royalism, as you call it, it's hard to get out of it. But where, if at all, are you seeing pushback or signs of dissension from the many people who've been publicly humiliated or have otherwise lost Social standing, power, wealth, etc. Uh, a very important, a very important question. So, uh, well, I mean, part of the answers basically can be explained through through fear, right? So, I I think, uh, for now, it seems like fear has has continued has continued to be effective. Mm -hmm. So, which mean that maybe the king can still you know go out and about and then continue to 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 behave in such a way, continue to rule in such a way that that system seemed to work for the time being. Uh, that also not just only applicable to the people who work for him or other state institutions, but all, but also the public. But again, I said that that there's a sign of of uh, discontentment, you know, through uh, the, the 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 protest. I think it is very in interesting that how the king will manage to work alone without any proxy. But yet, you know, um, managed to share interest with other institution that continue to support the monarchy, right? I don't know how he how, how he has been doing it. I think right now is an experimental experimental period for the king as well. I think so far, uh, uh, maybe one way of treat, help him trying to hand pick his own army chief is a way of him making his own connection with the military. You know, it might not be through the previous council like in the past. Yeah, but I think I, I think the king has his own way. Uh, but again, I don't know for how long that 
that other powerful elite within the military would start to stand up and say that this has been unfair. We want the old system back, like under p u i p o n or we want new system altogether, right? Because what uh, Park uh, Gao Gai has done in the in the parliament, talking about the t u c h a n g right? The, the 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 sort of the corruption within within the both the police and the military, uh, using the name of the king in order in order to get a rapid promotion, that also really upset a lot of people in in the military and also in in the in the police as well. So I, I just I just remember that talking about you know a group of protests in Thailand. We just want want to make sure that you know we provoke those people to think that it has been unfair to them. So that they they really could could stand up. So again, I don't I don't know for how long you know this institute is this key institution or you know powerful player within the military or even within within the judiciary you know started to stand up and say no this is not right. Uh, but I think for now for some reason uh, the king has been able to control. Uh, perhaps maybe again going back to fear. I know the explanation here might be a bit a little bit lame because I don't I don't think fear can explain everything. But I think we are still in the early early period of the of of the b a s h o n g o n era to to see things more clearly because I still do not think that the king the new king has set up anything more concrete for his for his foresee foreseeable you know reign. So I think right now we is 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 a trial period as I say. Uh, I hope there's an answer. <laughs> okay, that is. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions in a minute, but I'm just going to have one follow-up question. Yeah. You talked a little bit about the military, and there's a question here from Eric White about the relationship between the monarchy and prominent business uh, interests and groups, and how they may have changed. And I just want to ask you, not only because it's a good question, mm -hmm. Eric Vance asked it, but also because you've talked about fear and the use of coercion, shame, mm -hmm. firing, all of these kind of negative punishment sanctions. Have we seen evidence that the king is also using persuasion, economic <coughs> co-optation? Is he treating certain groups differently to try to forestall? That backlash mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. certain military actors who aren't part of the red room or whomever. Sure. Well, that's exactly what I what I said earlier about uh, the the case of the of the uh, Gao Gai men uh, talking about mm -hmm. you know the king would favor certain groups over mm -hmm. certain. Again, I mean now 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 that you ask me, well, I don't know whether this is about divide and rule <clears throat> of you know uh, favoring one group. To other group, I'm sure that I mean uh, whoever he 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 handpicked as the army chief, you know he have to he have to have a kind of you know a uh, close relationship, and he hope to build a similar kind of working relationship with that particular group in the in the military. Mm -hmm. So I think yes, definitely, definitely that is the case. And also even I'm talking about dismissal and 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 demotion, there are also cases of promotion as well, and returning returning of. Of, of the of the of the of the previous status, right? Again, going back to the the case of uh, Sinina, uh, uh, that that's that's also a case that that if you sort of if you if you realize that you were wrong, and then you prepared, you know, to to improve yourself, then then you will be forgiven. I think this has also become a tactic of the king, and that's there has been a number of cases that people were dismissed, and then they have their Status reinstated as well. So. Okay, and anything on the specific Bangkok business? Oh know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think I think I, it seems like business uh uh is going as usual, right? For the for the uh the the relationship between uh the monarchy and big 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 business in Thailand, and and I think I think even more so now, uh given that the king is the is the 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 entire. Owner of the Car Property Bureau, and don't forget that Car Property Car Property Bureau has invested so much, you know, in Thailand. You know, uh, anyone want to compete, you know, in terms of business in Thailand, you know, that one thing you must know that you must compete with the Car Property Bureau. So, uh, and again, now that now that the king, uh, totally own, uh, the, the 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 property, so uh, it even more so because uh, when I said that because you know all these big conglomerates it has to. Has to has to be sure that they have to nurture a kind of you know friendly relationship with the monarchy. And one evidence is that you know these people could not wait to line up to see the king whenever the king you know open up his palace and you know to get sort of donation 
from big businesses, right? Uh, and I think I think this even more so uh, compared compared with the previous rent. Uh, you started to see like uh, you know top people from CP from uh, you know other big companies in Thailand, you know, just basically giving away the money for the king to use as he switch. As if he needs more, right? I mean, yes. what is it, ninety six billion or exactly. something crazy? As the FEC, he needs more. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, questions from the audience, and then I have a few more online. Um, sir? How did you feel about the student protesters sharing a cut out of you back in 2020? Uh, can I just, no, no. The student protesters were sharing a cut out of you okay. in those protests. Uh, are you talking about the, 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 the image? The photo of the king. No, of, of you. Of you. They were carrying you. Oh, oh, me. Oh, sorry. Oh my god. <laughs> I thought I, th I thought other other, you know, uh, graffiti and also the, the image. That that you know, that insult uh insult the world. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you want to see me as Queen of Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would say. All right. I, I, I oh, wouldn't mind, you know. To... I mean, it, it would have been a nice status to have. <laughs> Not with the current king. <laughs> uh, question over here. Thank you. Um, during your talk, you mentioned that public, and when you were talking about public humiliation, you included the word cursing. Um, as someone who does not speak Thai, and perhaps you, when you were using the Thai word, you knew the idea of cursing means something different. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that and why that's something that you know you chose public humiliation? But you also included cursing as a separate comma. Can you, can you speak about that a little bit, please? Yeah. Uh... I mean, cursing, cursing has been with Thai politics for, for some time. I mean, for a long, long time, in fact. Uh, I mean, I, I like to use cursing tactic, you know, in order to undermine. Uh, uh, for example, even the monarchy as well. But I mean, this is from the perspective of, for your question, from the pers perspective of the monarchy first. Yeah, I think not often during the previous reign that we, we would read statements like that from the Royal Cassette. Right about dismissing people, which come with you know this kind of damning explanation, right? Uh, uh, this word, this kind of word. I mean, it's it's very bad. Seriously, you know, if if you know Thai enough, you will know that normally we we would never use this kind of language, especially not from first, not from the state, you know, to employee, but this definitely not from the monarchy, which is supposed to be sort of high up, which is supposed to be sort of puddy. No, usually Pudi would never use this kind of language, even though it might be polite in that in, in, in that context. So that's why it 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 show that that the that 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 order come with an extreme uh disapproval of that particular person. And they must they must they, they just want you to know that that this is really bad. Don't do it again. Right? I warn you, something like that. But I mean, the other way around too, cursing as well. Uh, you started to also see in 2020 a uh, protest using, using cursing as a tool against the monarchy. This would, would, this would have not, would have, would not been possible at all. Of course, it's less majestic, right? But, but even during Ramana, even toward the end of it, People talk about it, but yet no one ever made it in public. This time they make it in, in public in the face of Les Majesty Law. So I think this has become a new culture using cursed language, you know, to, uh, to, and I, I think very more, and more, more specifically, you know, I mean, I, I have to say this, uh, I have to, to change this a little bit, to, to amend this a little bit, that you started to see cursing language during uh, the red shirt protests. Yeah, right. So quite a lot of them. Right, in passing, not 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 specifically meaning who, but of course people know. But I think right now they say it so specifically about the current king, about the cursing. So I think it's it started to go both ways. Very interest, very interestingly, I think someone from Colombia, uh, student, you know, doing a project and called me last month to interview me on uh, uh, uh this thing called quantine. I, I it's very difficult to wording up. Stop irritating something like that. That that the 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 the, the younger generation started to use this quarantine tactic in order to uh to be a part of their protest, and I think it worked really well. 
So I think maybe you could lump all this together as a way of you know how the palace operate and how the protest also you know sending the message across. Okay, question in the back, sir. You mentioned about international growth a lot. In how would you analyze the outcome? Yeah, I got that question from the BBC, as if it were uh, for you know for the for the royal household. So uh, it's very interesting this one. Uh, I did write a chapter on on Washington and his and and his overseas. How to, I can't I can't even remember remember the topic the the, the title. But but basically about Washington and royal and and international affairs. Let's put it that way. I mean, okay, to go to, to go to your question specifically first. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's called, sort of generated a number of discussion, uh, at least on social media, about, well, I mean, looking back at, at Queen Elizabeth, you know, reign, uh, was, that, was that so successful that, you know, even toward, toward the end of the day, of her days, you know, people, you know, started to come out to talk about, you know, how she had been, you know, great Mona, right? I mean, essentially, the British, they are royalists. Of course, there's a, there's a growing number of, of, of Republican, Republicans as well, right? But, but you can't deny that, that the, the monarchy, the British monarchy has served as, as a pillar, as, I mean, if you like to use the term of, of, of a, a stabilizing force, maybe to one extent in the British, in the English context. So it, it started to, gen, to generate, uh, gen, generate a conversation in Thailand, uh, whether would it be possible that we would follow in the footsteps of the British Muna, like being a totally constitutional? Whether, you know, at one point, we would be able to talk about the past of Elizabeth, you know, not, not, not people talk about good things about her. Also, you know, uh, especially uh, the, 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 the old colonies, you know, started to, to come out and said, look, even Queen Elizabeth has to be responsible, you know, for the, for the, uh, for past wrongdoings of the British, you know, uh, colonial empire, something like that, you know. But but we can say it, we can talk about it openly. We can even talk about when 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 we see Prince Charles walking out, and then Andrew people, you know, yell at Andrew, you know, or, or, or shout that you're not my king, and talking about Andrew and then his affairs, you know, in the United States, this and that. No, we can't, right? So I think I think it's li it's really a good uh, a good uh, incident that would you know that's that how to say give us some 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 food of thought in thailand uh to and and especially the younger younger generation to be more interested in the in the royal institution or what it would go ahead uh in the future now for for the other part about uh this is very interesting about international affairs and what should gone and uh it is, is, is it a topic that is quite close to my heart, you know, being a former diplomat as well, uh, even not a good one, even, even when I was there. Huipon <clears throat> was so wise using international alliance in order to elevate his position, you know, at the international level. But, but then again, you know, it would be unfair to, to, to compare the two reigns from that point of view, because with Puyipon, it came the Cold War, and the Cold War made things possible for the Thai monarchy, for, for Puyipon to weave this kind of special relationship with the United, United States in particular. And, 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 and that really, I mean, that's, that's also explained that the uh, United States, you know, has to be responsible for, uh, the, for the success, successful hegemonization of the monarchy in Thailand, right? But, but things, are very different today. We no, we no longer have the Cold War uh, as, as a context for the monarchy, you know, to play any big role at the international stage, right? Uh, so that means the Thai monarchy today do not need international recognition. This is the term that I use because I think international recognition was very important during the Cold War, you know, as, as a country surrounded by communist state. You know, if this is about the issue of national survival, national security, Right. And then to be able to get that, you have to be recognized internationally. And luckily, the United States, United States recognizing Thailand. But here, you know, I mean, there's no communist to be around, to be the ghost, you know, that we can use, you know, as an excuse. Uh, uh, international recognition, recognition today is no longer important because I think uh, this is this come with the role of the monarchy. Overall, that seemed to decline. 
and so much so you know in Thailand uh you know after the decline of Pumi Pon era uh another thing also he himself is not really keen on doing this kind of role and it, it is very evident you know again going back to uh, the Queen Elizabeth funeral in Thailand we talk about why the Thai king whether he was invited or not invited whether if he was invited why he decided not to go why he did not even nominate anyone to go on his behalf right I would think that maybe the invitation was there. It would be a bit strange not to invite fellow monarch, yeah, given that, uh, you know, Prince, Prince, exactly, Prince Andrew also came to Pumi Pon's funeral. And, 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 uh, and I think Charles, I mean, came to the, 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 the Golden Jubilee, something like that. So I think it, it, it would be a little, a little bit unusual. What is even, even more unusual, why? Uh, he did not want to go. Well, who can explain? Since we have no royal advice advisor, maybe I might be able to explain. <laughs> maybe they should hire me to be advisor. <laughs> so I don't think he's keen on building up this kind of international uh, alliance with, with other monarchs, with other you know, world leaders. I think this would be an, op uh, an excellent opportunity for the king to go and to mingle you know, with leaders of the world, especially since he had not started introductory tour, right? I mean, introdu introductory tour only came during King Pumipon. I mean, it had to only came with King Pumipon because previously, you know, King never, almost never traveled overseas, right? Uh, and then with Pumipon, because Pumipon had been here for 70 years, so there would be no other king. Uh, but, but, but I think the king has set up a certain, certain standard. And, and one of the standards has been to go out and introduce yourself, you know, as new king. Of, of this kingdom, but I don't think this, this, the, the current king has any interest in it. I mean, as I said, again, this would be an, an, an excellent opportunity, you know, to, to go and meet at least, you know, the British royal family and to properly introduce himself that, you know, I am, you know, of course, king of Thailand. I think he's not bothered. Uh, uh, that's why he picked uh, Germany, you know, to, to live in a countryside anywhere, anyway. And uh, yeah, maybe he might not want to dress something more formally. Um, Andy, go ahead. I have a question about legitimation. So the former king, sacred, <clears throat> populist, democratic. This king, does he have any story to tell about why he deserves to be king? A good question. There is no story to back up. So that's why it's very important. You know, I, I think I'm sure that, you know, people inside the palace must have, must have thought about Neo royalism under Wajirongo. But there is nothing to be, to be built on. That is, that is the problem. That's why I think that's why if, if you talk about the, uh, you know, the monarchy being wobbly, this is exactly because there is no foundation for Ramadan to, to be built on, right? I mean, in three pillars, there's nothing about him. But what is interesting is that he knows. Yeah, I know. And I don't even want to pretend that. You have to you have to build me up on something. I just want to be to to be this way, right? So I'm not sacred. So don't even try to say that I'm sacred. No, seriously. And then and he showed by you know going right this three some relationship, right? Uh, this is a part of being sacred because this is how Pumipon portrayed himself, right? Being a family man, just monogamous, yeah. And then this is how, you know, good Buddhist was supposed to be. No, he, he wouldn't care. Enough. Okay, maybe he might go to this temple, this and that, but that is normal. I don't think, I don't think anything, you know, could be considered as sacred, you know, about, about the king. Obviously, with the king, the king photo leaking out in crop top. <laughs> no, we would, not, we would not have thought that this particular monarch is sacred, right? Popularity, of course not, right? Not the way that he treat people. And... Again, with being democratic, uh, it's very difficult to explain. I don't think I don't think he he would want to uh, to create anything, any any new persona of him that would be uh, authoritative. I just I just think he is being King Washington, and just using you know <clears throat> the power that he has given by you know, his father, perhaps maybe still loan, loaning some legitimacy, some legitimacy left over, 
by what why by Pumi Pon, but I don't think it would last long. So that's why I think it's, it's crucial to see, I mean, in the next five to ten years of how the the the, the, the direction would go. Going back to 2020 uh, protest, that is the first sign of of all these kind of things maybe start to crumbling down. Can I just follow up on this issue of sacredness and legitimation? One of the things that's been very surprising, or perhaps not, um, is the number of monks, mm -hmm. right, that have been out in protests, even though they are forbidden, right, by the rules of the Sangha to engage in this. You've also seen a lot of centralization of the monarch's mm -hmm. authority over the Sangha. You've seen many conservative abbots kick the monks out, right? They're calling them carrot tops, right? The, uh, as protesters. So obviously this is a sign of a lack of sacredness as, as you've described it and the ultimate delegitimization by the Buddhist mm -hmm. monks, a key pillar of that neo-royalist ideology. So how does that play out if the king, <laughs> as you seem to imply, does not want to make any effort to try to change his persona mm -hmm. in ways that would legitimate his rule in a similar way to mm -hmm. well I think first I, I think first thing this this is how I how the king operates thing. I don't think I don't think he want to I don't think he want to change himself you know to to accommodate existing structure i just I, I i think he just want existing ex existing structure to accommodate him. To, to to his new rule or new way or new style of governance that is one thing second thing is uh, i have to i have to admit you know uh right here that i'm, I'm no expert on sangha mm -hmm. and even though i work on monarchy right and and there's there is this dynamic relationship between sangha and the monarchy no i have not done any research so so i, I have become handicapped here to talk about that but just and my own uh, observation is it is very interesting that uh, during the during the Pupuipon era, you hardly heard any any kind of you know conflict within the Sangha. Mm -hmm. It seemed like Sangha was so unified under Pupuipon, but just like all things you know uh, that happened at the twilight years of Pupuipon, when things start to fall down because just because the Pupuipon consensus start to fall down, then you started to see the Sangha falling down. And I think from this point over, you 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 started to see fragmentation within uh within the sangha as we seen today. But I think one thing that the king people might think that he did right was what his own nomination of the of the of the the supreme patriot. Mm -hmm. So that somehow I think he still he still see it quite important that that the 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 the, 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 the supreme patriot have to be in line or in tune with with the monarchy. This is just a footnote. Then, maybe the maybe the king might not believe in this kind of you know sacredness thing, but I think he believes so much in superstitions, and then people inside the palace you know would have told you, you know many 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 story. I think by nominating you know the the, the the supreme patriot might be a part of him believing in superstition rather than he, that rather than believing in the sangha itself. You know about the, him being enthroned that had to be acknowledged or recognized by the supreme patriot otherwise you would not fulfill uh how, how it's called supreme kingship something like that so uh, yeah i i think i think i think this is very interesting to look at how the king deal with uh, uh institution like like the sangha right people people would go on on talking about you know uh when people when he demoted someone uh, getting married with his wife, it has to be certain days, certain hours of the. But I think I think this has this has been common for Southeast Asia. Right. right. We had a question over here, and then one in couple in the back. Go ahead. I was going to ask: Is there any indication of how he's going to use his power and wealth in the long term? Uh, how how he use his power in long term, and well, uh. Uh, I mean, I I talk I talk a little about the trial period. I still I still do not know whether there would be something more more structure coming in a way. I suspect there would not be one. Uh, I suspect that I think right now, if he has this ability to control 
uh, the uh, the political elites and also the public, then it would be fine for him. I think I mean, if there would be something to to notice. Uh, especially since the protests of 2020, I think the king started to, uh, to go back into his own his own shell a little bit, and that might be that might be beneficial for the monarchy, but it might not be so good for the for the for the public. Meaning that, uh, I talk to you know a, a, a lot of, of protesters in Thailand. They are waiting for the day for them to come back on the street, but then they could not find the right moment yet. Right, and even if they could find the right moment, moment, then what would be the right topic again? Of course, they, they they would want to talk about royal reform because it had not been advanced. But then talking about the same royal reform, it might be repetitive and redundant. It it might not excite the crown. Yeah, and it it is very difficult because, at least in the past one or two years, there had been no issue with the king, especially controversial issue coming up. No new controversial issue. So that's why I don't know whether he started to realize that if I if I sort of become, you know, keep it low profile, thing would be better. Meaning low profile, meaning that even, even I'm a royal watcher, I I I I I I, I, I lost track of whether he's in Thailand today or in, in, in Germany. I would have known in the past. Not today, I don't, right? It's, it become very quiet. So I don't know. Because if that become an issue, then maybe we we could talk about or say say something about it. Now he go out less often, but but still, during you know important uh, event, then he would show up. Even more caro choreography caro carefully choreograph with the wife. That's it, not the third one. So people start to think, oh, this this start to look like a normal family. Yeah, so I don't know why. Maybe, maybe I I try. I tend to overanalyze, but I mean, I have to find a reason of of why why things seem to be rather quiet on the part of the monarchy. Which again, I get maybe 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 eventually he got an 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 advisor to 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 tell him that you should do thing and say thing, uh, you know, less in in the face of the public, something like that. Um, there was a question here, the woman in black and then the gentleman in the red. Yeah. A lot of people are questioning the Queen Consort um, because the palace has been absolutely quiet about it. What are your thoughts? People imagine that I, I have direct line to her. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish you have. No, even though though I got a uh, I got an anonymous uh, letter, you know, which uh, included the, the the sort of a file with one thousand four hundred photo of her, you know, mail, mailing it to me in in Kyoto. Uh, I think I think it has been. I don't know. I mean, first thing I, I have to say that I don't know, but I think it must have been an, a sort of ongoing uh, struggle within the palace, and I think I think this is the best way for the uh, for the king to try to separate them, right? And they maybe this is this this is the most likely scenario that uh, she is being kept in Germany doing her own thing right but I just I just, I just read news you know by Prashatai yesterday that she was nominated by the king to be a, an editor weird of doing a book on on Buddhist uh, uh, prince, pre, precept or principle something like that writing a book a book on Buddhism and she is <laughs> <laughs> she's the editor since when she's an authority of Buddhism. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, but I, I think I think that maybe they try to separate. And also because of, of the new image, if you want, if you want to say so about being a you know a happy family man and, and, and separating them. But 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 this is not enough. That this is not enough because because you introduce her to the public, you can't take away her from the public. Uh yeah, maybe one thing for the enter entertainment. You know, reason all all the young all the young royalists and non royalists they would want to know her where it's about right if it, ex exactly for its inter entertainment purpose. But on a on a more serious note, that she has she she now has an official status. We as the Thai public need to know her whereabout. Most importantly, her well being, right? Because because she had been put in jail before, and even when the the when the fact that she was put in jail without any good reason. I mean, all that reason. I don't think. I mean, it's just basically hu to to humiliate her, and then and then to to basically let her out of prison, 
going back to the the legal basis of the king you know uh, command so but but more importantly i think the public has the right to know uh what she is doing because she is spending taxpayer money that's all can i um just follow up on this notion of the king as a good family man because there's um a question or two about who will succeed mm. um the current king we know that he disowned his four children from his second wife is there a new king in in waiting <laughs> during uh the at, at the event of a uh, queen elizabeth funeral uh one of the reasons that people on on the internet talk about is that and he could have nominated he could have nominated his successor you know to go uh on his behalf but then there is no successor right now there is no heir apparent there is only as i believe a presumptive right uh that i think this is a big this is a big 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 question and i have to refer to what paul hanley uh said in in our book that the success of, of monarchy in the world uh is because it because they managed to create pool of successors they have to, they have to have enough successor right uh but i think in thailand in the thai case it's dry up it's being dry up uh and not only is being dry up the the king wachongon has no how to say urgency in uh encouraging his children to get married and produce you know potential successor now if you look at the the official you have official and unofficial children of the king uh if you if you look at official children of the king none of them has got married this is again very unusual for any royal family in the world right are we talking about the eldest daughter ong pa you know she's i think 40 i believe has remained single as we understood right I, I behind the scene i we don't know but but then there's an issue of you know uh then then that there is no one to 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 succeed the throne because there is no a uh, new member of royal family the second one the so called fashion designer right with her so called french boyfriend whom we never seen uh again that is the same issue the boy there is a big issue with with prince tipangon even though he is right now a presumptive the issue is that with with the mother because we don't know that the mother was had had been put under house arrest there's a lot of rumors about whether she has been read, let out of, of house arrest or not i don't know but then would anyone imagine the future king with mother under house arrest i would not even by then she might she, she could have been released would you imagine the past of the the past of the the, the mother of the king has been put under house arrest has been shamed in public right i don't even want to talk about her her background right uh but yeah that's why that's why i i i i don't know where whether tipangon would be that uh prospective uh successor in the eyes of the of the royalists and uh even even with ong pa become the next monarch then the 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 the, the, the problem the problem doesn't stop there then who would come next after ong pa with the british uh, royal family now you know the fourth and the fifth generation with that knowing knowing that you know uh, that kind of line of succession it gives stability and stability mean everything you know and it's not just stability of of the british monarchy it's stability for the british political life as well right and and this is the case of of the monarchy being under under constitution it ten times worse with the case of thailand when you know it's sort of you know under constitution above constitution within the constitution and then yet we don't know the future of the monarchy so it's it's, it's hard last point about the the four disowned children in the united states uh i have i have a fortune to be able to communicate with them but i have to end and right there but just enough to say that they might stand ready <laughs> should that be changed all in right. thailand I, but I that's see all head shaking there so we're not going to get into that speculation particularly with so little time um there was a question in the back from the gentleman in the corduroy shirt 
Um, so I'm going to bring this a little bit back to the question of legitimacy for the king. Um, so I agree with your analysis about there uh, it might not be might not care too much about the legitimacy, but there are also another side of of him establishing kind of voluntary like or um, asking for volunteers to their bureaucracy for workshops or uh, even last month sending letters to students asking for volunteers to work for him. So how do you explain that is it an attempt uh, to reestablish that persona or is it just an attempt to find more people to work for him? I think it's a failed attempt. It's a very failed attempt simply because when when you call out for one volunteer like this, people have to believe in system. And that that is basically that is a basic requirement. I mean, if you do not believe in in the system, then no one would want to volunteer, right? So with Pu oh my God, there would be thousands, thousands of people, millions to volunteer because people believe in the system, and that that system comes with legitimacy of the king. Again, going back to what what you God, I don't think I don't think that is anything that people that would make people would uh, believe. I think, you know, uh, this is the least attempt of him to want to create a kind of leg legitimacy by, uh, by coming up with this kind of project. Is this a PR ploy? Maybe, yeah. Is it a way of him to try to engage with the public? Maybe, but it has been very limited, right? Uh, we, we, because, of the, because of the way in which this project is operating. Absurd again, right? You have to wear a certain uniform. You have to have that blue, you know, scarf. And, and it's just, it's just, I think to me, it's very similar to what Vashila would used to do with the Boy Scout, right? You just set up, you know, your own tiny unit, loyal to the king, but that's it. No, nothing, nothing appealing to the public. So uh, people of, I mean, often, of, often make joke about this kind of, you know, project. Did Asa, nah. sorry. Okay, last question we're going to take um, from the online audience, um, because it dovetails with part of the reason you're here in the US um, and your background. And the question uh, is from Wirata Salim, and she says that we've seen how the young protesters try to communicate with the international community and demand um, monarchical reform. Uh, do you think that there's any way that democratic societies like the United States can attempt to hold the monarchy accountable. Thank you for that question. And, and this is a question that, that I've been waiting, in fact, and it's, it's, it's a good end to the talk. And this also link up to my mission in the United States as well. But let's talk about that, that question first. That, okay. That's so much so to do. Six okay, that's so, <laughs> <laughs> that's so much so to do in terms of uh, international uh, international engagement with, with what happened in Thailand. And I don't think I don't think the international community has done enough, right? Uh, I do not want I do not want them to think that this is very much a local issue in Thailand. The the the, the struggle, right? Uh, democratic demo, democratic struggle is basically just you know a local issue, so doesn't cause an impact, you know, even on regional basis or international basis. No, it's not true. Of course, it's not. Uh, I mean, and Thailand is not alone facing this problem in Southeast Asia. So, but but I, I have seen little uh, attempts or input, you know, from uh, our good friends in the West, you know, to try to uh, put effort or pressure, you know, for changes in Thailand. Now, uh, going back to what the young could do. Well, I've been talking to them as well. I think, I think you know, they, they, they might have to think wider and, and broader. I think some of them might, might need to come out more rather than just, you know, doing campaign within Thailand, rather well, maybe coming out more to talk to, you know, key allies of Thailand, to talk to uh, important institutions in the West. Uh, I, I, think, I think the efforts so far for them, especially in linking up with multi-alliance, 
even though it come accidentally rather than something more intentionally, that has been very good. And it's, it's, it's such a good example of, you know, solidarity across the border that make the Thai issue, you know, more international. And it has been very evident wherever I go. For example, when we're going to have meeting in Vancouver, I just came from Vancouver. You know, if you only want the Thai people to come, it might not be big enough, but then you can call upon your colleague from Burma, Myanmar, from Nepal, from India, you know, they come and, and then at least they keep their build up number. And then not just build up number, but but then we share concerns and, and how to make this issue, you know, sort of make it louder. I think I think that is important. So this is my only suggestion that, you know, you have to come out more and start to talk to, you know, foreign, foreign government, foreign government more. And from, from the viewpoint of, of the foreign government, this is I, I I understand, you know, coming from MFA, you know, that that you have something called national interest. You know, national interest, sometimes you do not want to compromise so much. You know, if you support pro democracy movement, then it has to be compromised with your economic interest or your political status, you know, in that particular country, then you might not, you might not want, you might not be too keen to do so. But hey, you can do it in a more balanced way. I'm not saying that it has to be zero sum game or without this. And you have this, oh no, you're not. And then with the United States, and I'm in the United States, and it's pissed me off so much that you're talking about, you know, promotion of democracy, giving scholarship to this and that. And, you know, when it comes to talking to the junta in Thailand in the past, and even the current government in Thailand, you know, looking at the talking points, I'm very disappointed. Now, going back to the last point, why I'm here, uh, I, I guess I have maybe three minutes left or two minutes. I am uh, setting up this solo project uh, called One One Two Watch. In fact, the the the, in, the the website I show I shown you earlier is basically from a One One Two Watch project. I I happen to got a grant. One One Two Watch dot org. One One Two is basically Article One One Two, Last Majesty Law. Now, briefly, I mean, as I said, I have done this for a long, long time, you know, coming out to talk to the, a lot of people, and then I I got really tired, and partly it's because I I was not in Thailand. It's always very difficult when you're not in Thailand. I can't go back to Thailand. I'm, you know, sitting comfortably, as most people would say, in Kyoto. Now, two years ago, I thought, hey, what could I do better sitting outside Thailand? Maybe I want to do international advocacy. And basically, this is about international advocacy. But doing international ad advocacy, you have to have one, one issue. You can't go out and do five, six, seven issues. And then ask myself, what is the, what is the most important issue for me? It has to be 112, Article 112, because I, 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 I am also a victim of Article 112 as well. So that's why I came up with this 112 watch. It's basically an, a personal uh, international advocacy attempt in order to go out you know, uh, to different countries to talk to uh, government, to talk to NGO, civil society organization, in order to raise awareness of the, the problem uh, with, with Article 112. I know that a lot of people have done this, but uh, this, this initiative uh, for the time being is, I want to create a new dialogue, a new narrative about Article 112 to make foreign government like the United States being a little bit more excited about how they can engage, engage with the issue of Article 112 in a new way. They have been doing it, but I don't think it's enough, right? I don't know what would be the final, how to say, uh, formula to this. I'm still, I'm still learning. This is a part of my learning curve as well. So, but, but at least, you know, I just want to come out and talk to different people and, and try to find a new way of how to, how to, how to, minim, how, how to minimize risk, for example, of the United States when engaging with Thailand, when you look at national interest, but at the same time, you can, you can go more firmly on critical issue like Article 112. Please visit, and I need volunteer, unlike Jit Asana. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, Kap. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree that uh, Ajahn Pawin gave us a tour de force today, both very academic as well as personal, and is certainly up to date on uh, the role of the Thai monarchy um, and his activist work. So please join me uh, in a great round of applause. Thank you. And I apologize to those of you online um, that I couldn't get to all of your questions. Thank you. All right. Are we offline?